All right, everyone. Um, I'll wait for a few minutes so that uh, people who are in the uh, classroom can come in uh, to Zoom. So I apologize for the last minute change on Tuesday and also Thursday. Yeah, I think this week is quite hectic for me. Let's wait just for uh, one or two more minutes and then I'll, I'll get the class started. All right, so let's get started. Yeah. So yeah, uh, for those who just came in, uh, yeah, I apologize for the uh, last minute change from the in-person class to Zoom class. I think there are a few uh, issues happening to me this week, um, but hopefully let's get uh, started and yeah. Okay, so I think I have a few important announcements. Uh, number one is that starting from actually not starting in assignment two. So in fact, I missed it. So I would say starting from assignment three, please submit the IPIMB file. So the co-op link is not accepted anymore. So this is to prevent potential cheating. Um, co-op file might change after you submit, right? Because it's actually Google Drive link and we have actually have spotted a few uh, cases like that. I mean, that could have been due to mistakes. So we're not going to, we're not going to penalize you for doing that. But in future, we want to prevent that. So please submit the IP, IPINB file. Um, in, uh, so not the link. So I, if you actually recall, uh, the requirement was that you submit the PDF and also either the IPINB file or the collab link. But now there's no more or you need to uh, submit the, the notebook file and you can actually download this uh, from the collab. Okay, so it's to prevent petition cheating. So please uh, cooperate with us. And number two really important announcement is that we're actually, we have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a few really important announcements. So if you actually, there are a student that who didn't come, and if, it's, if it's your friend, then please tell them that there are a few changes. Uh, I'll probably, of course, uh, tell you this uh, for the uh, next few classes, but the quiz seven to 11, so there will be five quizzes, right? Five quizzes. Then those scores will count towards your grade, okay? So it will actually be the 5% of the 10% participation. And remember that your grade is uh, broken down into 80% assignments, of course, the 80% assignment can be, 40% of the 80% can be your final projects. You have an option to choose that. And then the rest of the, tw uh, the rest 20% has two portions. One is the attendance, 10% attendance that you're, you're basically being graded on whether you come to class. And the other 10% was the participation. And the 5% of the participation comes from your TAs, basically how much uh, you participated in the uh, lab sessions. And then the, the other 10% is coming, the other actually 5% is coming from these quiz results. We have five quizzes, so that means each quiz will be 1% and actually we'll have five questions per quiz, so which means probably one question will be 0.2% of your final grade. So uh, it's an important thing. Uh, please uh, try to do well on the quizzes. They're usually true or false, so hopefully uh, you'll not get that bad grades. In, in the worst cases, right? And the assignment three will be released next Tuesday and will be due in two weeks from then. 
So it will be Tuesday of May, May 17th, 11 p.m. So um, this will be actually on Transformer. So uh, what uh, up, up to what we cover today will be actually on the assignment. So uh, it's at least a good thing that the assignment will be uh, after the classes that we did. Um, so yeah, that's the, so I mean, assignment is covering the classes up to today. So uh, please note that. And number four, the, it's also important for those who are considering replacing two last two assignments with the project. I told you this in the uh, first class, but I'm giving you a reminder. So you will have to choose whether you will do the assignment three or four, three and four, or the final project by the deadline of assignment three. So in fact, um, if you choose to do final project, in that case, instead of submitting assignment three, you will actually submit a simple form. Well, the actual form actually contains uh, um, what, uh, describing what you, you're going to work on your, for your final projects or what you have been working on, depending on, I guess, uh, your um, time frame uh, when you're submitting your uh, assignment, I mean, the, the paper to the conference. Remember that the final project is actually usually for those who are working on some publication this semester. So if you are not working on some publication, I will probably not recommend you to do final project because uh, the the way that we'll be grading this will be very similar to the conference reviewing process. I mean the the uh, the I would say the um, the grading um, well schema or the grading policy. So uh, we'll be actually out of uh, one to five. If you have actually ever submitted to ACL or the MNLP conferences, then you know that you will be graded between one one to five by each reviewer. So we'll be doing the same thing, of course, except that um, you will rarely get a score five. So uh, you will get 100% if our TAs, uh, uh, as a reviewer, uh, basically they will have the same standard when they're reviewing for the papers on the conference, uh, get four or five. So if you get four or above, then um, you will get 100% for your final project. And then your grade will be lower if you get, uh, of course, uh, lower than four. I'll actually give you the, the detailed rubric uh, with the assignment three release, and then maybe you want to decide depending on that, right? So uh, please note that. But anyways, anyways, uh, you will need to uh, decide that by the deadline of assignment three, which probably means that you will need to make a decision uh, for you, for yourself, uh, by probably next week or something like that, right? So any question on the uh, assignments and the announcements today. Please feel free to ask on the classroom too, if you have any. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so um, we have a few uh, things to go over. Uh, so we'll start from actually by pair encoding and we'll go through uh, layer normalization, efficiency of transformer, accuracy of transformer, and relative position encoding. All of these are basically details transformer. And um, uh, so let's first get started with the bipair encoding, okay? So what is BP? Okay, there's a question by the way. Okay, when can we check the score of submit assignment? So uh, we have actually finalized the, uh, almost finalized the assignment one scores. We plan to release that next week. Um, and one thing to note is actually we have spotted a few cheating cases. So we'll, we'll need to actually make sure one more time if those are actually cheating or not. And uh, of course, if, if you have cheated, then you will get score of zero and also um, you will actually be potentially reported to the school. So please do not um, you know, cheat. And I think everyone knows what cheating, uh, cheating means, right? So um, like copying and 
plagiarizing. Anyways, so but we'll we plan to actually uh the uh release this course by next week. Okay, so let's first uh get started with the bipair encoding. So what is bipair encoding? So this is actually one way to tokenize text. We talked about different ways of tokenizing text, right? And I think one of the simplest way is actually using a space split, space tokenizer. And the good thing about that is it's very simple, but then a uh, bad thing is that if you actually split by token space, then you actually have a lot of out of uh, vocab. And, and also if you want to create some uh, rule-based tokenizer that will be very costly for new languages. And in fact, transformer uses a uh, bi-pair encoding or actually the, the up uh, upcoming models, most models will be using some sort of bi-pair encoding. And this was actually originally used for data compression. So BP was not really for tokenizer, it was for uh, the uh, compressing data. And the core idea is quite easy. It wants to define a set of tokens that best compresses the data. So you basically want to define a vocab that can compress your data best. Because if you replace really frequent token pairs or token sequence with some new word, then you will use less data to actually represent the text that contains the new word, right? So that's the basic idea. So if there are too many tokens that uh, it'll be expensive to store the token definitions, right? So, which means you still don't want to create too many tokens or, uh, well, I mean, I think it's more accurate to say this, these are the word units. Okay. So if you have too many word units, then um, it will be expensive to store the, uh, these word unit definitions. But then if, you're, if there are too many, uh, too few uh, word units in the vocab, then there won't be much compression, right? So basically really the important thing about bipair encoding is finding a sweet spot. And it's still, of course, um, you know, this is, has the same characteristic as typical tokenizer in, in a sense that uh, there, there is actually, you know, um, some compression if you have used some sort of vocab uh, but then the, the difference is that the objective here is to do the compression. And um, it was actually especially popular in the machine translation community because uh, it was uh, data dependent. Um, in the BPs, what, what I mean by it here is that BP is uh, data dependent and it did not require complex regular expression based tokenization methods for diverse languages. So you can make a tokenizer very fast for even languages that you have never seen. And of course, also BP is data driven, which means it's not impacted by the humans. So it's um, much more, e much easier to maintain and also improve. So how does BP work? It's actually quite simple. So uh, the core idea is that at every iteration, you basically go through several iterations of uh, defining new word unit every time. And for every iteration, you define the new word unit to be uh, a pair that occurs the most in the, uh, in the text. So let's say we're given a text like this. And then if, if, we, rep if we actually uh, try to count, then let's see, how, how many times A happened? There is a one, um, well, we, we count that one, so we don't actually count the second one and two, so there are actually two cases that AA happen. There is also um, a B that occurs um, one and two, right? How about the uh, uh, BD? BD is a one only once, right? How about DA? DA is also just once. How about um, AC? AC is just once, right? So we can just count a number of uh, frequencies. In some cases, actually, you can also um, use, anyways, yeah, so, so um, basically that's the, uh, how you can count the number of uh, frequencies and the frequencies for each pair. And now you will see that um, AA happens twice and AB happens twice. And let's just choose uh, just one of them because they're actually both uh, just most frequent pairs. So let's just choose. Um, this to be our new word unit. So now that's why we define Z to be the word unit AA. 
okay? Then we just um, very greedily just replace, uh, it's, it's a simple post, uh, procedure. You just basically, every time you see AA, you replace that with Z. So that's why we see Z here and also here, right? Quite simple. And now let's do the, uh, uh, let's count the frequency again. So how many times Z A happen? It happens uh, once and twice, right? So it's Z A happens twice. And how about the uh, A B? Uh, a B happens once and twice. So twice. Um, right. And then how about the uh, uh, B D? B D happens once. Just so it's, so we we're just going to write B D equal to one. How about the uh, uh, DZ? DZ just happens once. How about um, BA? BA happens just once and AC happens just once. So we now have to choose between uh, these two. And well, usually you'll, you'll, you'll want to prefer um, the frequency that, I mean, the, uh, the pairs that actually are coming from the na uh, native characters than uh, from the new war units. I mean, the, uh, basically there is a, you start with this native characters and then you create new characters or new war units. Um, so we're gonna choose uh, this. Of course, it's just a convention more than the, uh, there is any uh, really, um, I mean, there isn't really, of course, uh, much disadvantage of choosing ZA but then let's just do a, B first, okay? And then, um, then we're gonna define Y to be a, B, right? And then we place those, um, uh, the occurrences, and we, we're, not, we're now going to have this uh, compression. And then lastly, we're gonna count this again, and let's do uh, X, D, no, X, not X, D, uh, Z, Y, Happens twice, right? How about YD? Just once. DZ, once. Uh, YA, once. And AC is just once. So now here, here in this case, it's clear, right? We're going to uh, choose ZY to be X. And then now we have these three definitions, X, Y, Z. And then we have replaced the um, um, some of these um, characters with the new word units. So now it's much shorter, X, D, X, A, C. But there's an important thing to note here. So, okay, okay it's good that we actually made, made this shorter, the, uh, the sequence of interest, but then are we using less memory? Um, not necessarily, right? Because uh, in this case, actually we are using less memory, but then it's possible that if you have too many definitions here, then maybe your text sequence might be very short, but then your definition might be, or your definition might be really long, right? So one thing to note is that BP doesn't always mean that it will be the, the target will, target uh, will be always compressed as a whole. But then it will be compressed um, if you're just looking at the uh, the target text unit, of course, right? And so there are a few characteristics that you want to actually know, especially with respect to transformer and also um, what we're gonna actually cover in the next lectures. So number one is that. BP is a greedy algorithm that finds the most frequent pair at e each iteration, and this is greedy, so it's not optimal. So uh, it's important to note this because uh, you might think that it's something, some optimal algorithm that uh, way to compress the target, but it's not actually. Uh, and actually, that's it. That's why uh, this algor algorithm is very popular because the compression is very fast. I mean, at least finding the uh, good characters is very fast because it's greedy, and it's not yielding the optimal compression strategy. So in fact, uh, because of this, because they're trying to find the most frequent pair, which is very easy, but still they, uh, they think this is not good enough. So uh, people have thought about how to do this better. And one uh, way to do that is actually something like WordPiece. WordPiece is uh, proposed by Google. And in 20, uh, 2012, actually, uh, I recommend you to read it if you're interested. Basically aims to improve this issue if you just choose the most frequent pair, then it's actually greedy algorithm. So like, they actually create a, a very uh, shallow engram language model and then try to find a pair that optimizes 
so they're not finding the most frequent pair, but actually optimizes the likelihood of the training data by the language model by introducing new word units. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but then um, you can think of this as very similar to BP, just that the, uh, they, instead of finding the most frequent pair, they actually have another way to find this pair. And that's actually based on the Engram language model. And during the inference time, um, well, it was quite obvious here how we actually find which um, word unit we use for the compression, but um, it, it is usually, of course, uh, the, the use case is usually not uh, you're using BP for the training data, but you actually use for the new data that you have never seen, which means that you'll never know, uh, you know, whether this the current text, the first few characters of the current text matches um, this word unit or another word unit, which is longer. So in order to actually find the longest uh, token or word units, you actually start from the uh, longest one and then uh, decrease the length by one. Uh, every time you actually do not find the, the matching word units. So but that means you actually have to go through all the word units and it's very slow, it's because O of, o of M. But then in practice, well, and it, it's actually exactly why um, WordPiece is, um, well, was used initially because what they do is that they basically first split the sentence into words with a space tokenizer. So it's very simple um, space tokenizer, just a, in Python, we just split, right? The uh, string dot split and then um, now you basically can cache the tokenization for these words if you have ever seen that. So uh, for most words that you have seen during training, you, have, you can have cache, have, have cache of these, so it's very fast. And if you're working on some word unit that you have never seen, then you can still actually also uh, use hashing uh, to uh, basically save time. But still, um, it will be requiring some computations so um, in many cases, BP can be slower than uh, some tokenizers if not implemented correctly. So if you're using a tokenizer, it's actually important to use tokenizer that, that's optimized uh, on DC level, not just uh, you know, on Python, because if it's in Python, then sometimes your tokenizer might be actually um, the bottleneck when you're training your model, okay? And the, as the number of iterations increase, the vocab size usually increases, but it's not always the case um, because sometimes actually they can decrease, but because usually it increases, uh, you can just have a target size. Uh, for instance, okay, I want to have a vocab size of 30,000 and then I just want to increase the, uh, the well, number of word units until I get to 30,000. And initially you start with the characters, right? You, you saw that your word units will be all characters initially. And good thing about characters is that because character is something you can define with Unicode or ASCII, so it's actually fixed size, right? You will start with something, if it's ASCII, something like 256. If it's Unicode, it will be much larger, but still it's finite size. And then um, you can actually go up to uh, what, uh, what you can go up to the target size. Unicode, it will be larger than 30,000. So in fact, if you want, usually when you're, you're doing English, you actually um, have a, something that's larger than ASCII, but still smaller than Unicode. Uh, and then of course, um, increase do the iterations until you of course target size on the training data. Okay. Okay, so now that, let's get to the uh, best normalization. I might be a bit fast because um, yeah, I'll probably end the class uh, earlier today. But I think that's fine because today's materials is mostly um, basically supporting materials for transformer. Uh, we covered all the core ones last uh, in the last last lecture. So next is, uh, let's talk about normalization. So, um, well, actually, what is normalization or batch normalization, layer normalization, maybe you have heard of them. These are the regularization methods. And um, the one thing to notice that in the uh, early deep learning days, the regularizations was mostly about uh, regularizing the weights so that they cannot be too big. L2, L2 realization, for instance, and also using dropouts. And then um, in 2015, a very uh, important, uh, I would say, in invention was made. And that's actually uh, 
a new way of uh, regularizing the training. And of course, you know that uh, the regularization in training is to basically do basically lead the model to uh, a good optima, uh, optimum. And I think, I, I don't think it's any more, no more really I could just say that we want, uh, it's used for um, prevent overfitting because anyways, I think the models these days, um, if you're actually talking about the, whether they do pretty well on training data compared to test data, actually all models will be quite saturated on training data. Um, so it's more accurate to say that these regularization methods help you to reach good optima. And so it's a, and also it's kind of like, I would say more of an empirical thing than a theoretical. We have very little understanding of how, or how these work, but still we can try to describe or uh, try to explain. And batch normalization is very actually simple. So it's actually very simple. It's, it's just that you normalize each dimension uh, wherever you are at the, uh, during your uh, neural networks across many batch. So suppose that you're training a model then you know that you will have uh, intermediate states, right? Or hidden states. And suppose that that hidden state is usually a vector or matrix. And let's say that that vector has uh, several numbers and let's just look at just one dimension of that vector. And that is actually X. And um, this X will be different for across the batch, right? Because uh, you have different inputs. So that's why we have one to M here. The best size is M. Then what best normalization does is that uh, you, you first basically uh, compute the mean and the uh, standard deviation of, or I would say, or variance uh, of uh, these uh, xi. And that's very simple, right? If you just want to compute the mean, then that's just actually summation and then divide by one uh, m. If you want to compute the uh, variance, then you just basically compute how far it is from the mean and then square it and then sum and then average. And then of course, if you want to compute the standard deviation, you just square root it, right? Instead of variance. And that's why um, this is used to actually scale this. And that's called normalization, right? And then um, one thing that they do is that after that, they actually create uh, two parameters that can be trained, gamma and beta. And then you basically use this to multiply to each dimension and also add to it. And note that these values don't have any i, so it's not actually um, batch uh, the mini batch axis dependent. It's just that you add the same number and you multiply the same number to the all dimensions. I mean, not all dimensions, all all numbers in the uh, uh, in this dimension. And of course, uh, they also don't use they actually use the same gamma and beta across the dimensions. So there are only two values to learn for each layer or the each, I'll say, hidden states that you're applying batch norm. Of course, you're applying batch norm several layers in many cases. So in that case, then gamma and beta will be different for each layer. But still, the, there are only two parameters per batch norm. But it's also important to note that, of course, because this involves some new parameters. So when you're actually using batch norm on uh, PyTorch, then you can think of this as actually a more of a model that you, you need to train than just a function like, uh, you know, soft mics. And basically the, what they do is that they actually uh, mitigate the internal covariate shift. And that's very a uh, difficult term. Um, but then basically what you can think of this is that uh, the distribution of each layer's input uh, changes. And uh, we want to basically, uh, you know, prevent the, effect of that. And that's basically the, the, uh, the, uh, the I would say, um, the motivation behind, behind batch norm. And it is important to note that the, okay, there's a question. So why are R be needed? Oh, you mean the gamma and beta, right? Okay, so when they're needed because number one is that uh, normalization, it doesn't involve any parameter but then you want to have some degree of freedom so that these can actually fit into uh, the, the, your, what you want to model. So you can think of this as more of a degree of freedom. Um, and 
it's really hard to actually give a very precise reason why we need them, but it's more of a, if you give more uh, degree of freedom, then you can expect that your model will be uh, fitting to your uh, data better uh, in general, right? So uh, yeah, that you can think of like that. But one way to think about this is that uh, because you're normalizing it, you're actually uh, now moving this number vector, this value to very different distribution. Let's say your distribution was initially here and then because of this normalization, this would be entirely shifted and that will actually cause a lot of uh, issues potentially. And you're basically using this scale and shift to kind of uh, uh, maybe move closer to the original distribution a bit or in some way, uh, you know, easier to handle. And there might be actually some theoretical explanations. And I believe that these topics might be covered in the advanced uh, deep learning theory classes that uh, you can take. So hopefully you can also consider those things if you're interested. Um, I think in this class, it's, it, it suffice to say that best norm works pretty well on the rest nets or the image uh, classification image related models. And actually they enable the um, 100 plus layers of uh, neural networks. Without this, it was actually impossible. Racial net was actually very uh, dependent on the best norm. But also it's important to note that the racial blocks are essential to prevent the gradient from exploding. So in fact, they were actually uh, benefiting to, uh, uh, for each other. So ResNet uh, actually proposed the racial block and then the best norm was also essential for it to work. And then also it's the other way too. But the best norm didn't really work for transformer or the language, um, well, like LSTMs or RNNs. It's not really clear why they don't really work. Um, but then it, it, the authors of the transformer found that, or I mean, I guess uh, layer norm was also popular in the RNNs actually, initially. Um, layer norm was proposed to be good for both RNNs and the uh, like CNNs, but then the transformer found that actually Nano works pretty well on Transformer 2. And the how this works is quite similar to best norm, except that uh, where you're normalizing on basically the axis is different. So in layer norm, you normalize each dimension across layer. Uh, that means then not the across batch. So it's actually uh, very simple because when you're computing the, uh, in the batch norm, at least you're depending on the, what examples you choose in many batch. So it might be a bit more complicated, but now there is no normalization happening across the mini batch. It's just that within each example, but then now you're normalizing within the, each hidden state. So um, that's actually a bit, I would say, sometimes uh, it's not really super intuitive, right? Because you're actually normalizing your hidden, hidden state vector entirely. And after you have done that, and then you just scale and shift uh, in a similar way, but a bit different, which is that instead of now scaling with uh, or shifting with the uh, scale value, you actually scale with scale them with the vectors. So that's why you see these bold vector. These are vectors, not scalars. Uh, remember that the batch norm used scalar values for these, right? Actually, my bad, not this one. Yeah. These are the parameters. So. Layer norm also has parameters, but it has more parameters per layer, right? Because it has to have a parameter the same size of the hidden state size, twice of that, because you have a, a scale and also shift. But other things are same. And it, it is known to work really well with transformer and it's not theoretically clear why there is such difference, why layer norm works better. There are people trying to explain this in the, on the theory side, I think these days deep learning theory is more about uh, uh, things that work pretty well on the empirical um, evidence. And then they try to explain why that works, but that's not super clear. But definitely this actually improves performance just like uh, many you know, regularization methods, but also they actually improve training time too, which means they converge faster. So that's very nice. That's very different from, I would say dropout for instance, because dropout actually increases the training time um, if you use that. But still, they're actually using both, right? They use layer norm and also drop out. So it's not just that they're using layer norm. And these regularization methods, you can think of them as uh, guiding the model to not fall into bad optima. 
So you're using many regularization methods to actually uh, for the model to reach good optima in general. Okay, so any question about denormalization? All right, so next is uh, efficiency of transformer. So it's actually very um, straightforward, I think, relatively. But I just want to remind you with these advantages of transformer compared to RNNs or other uh, models. Uh, first is the complexity per layer. So this is, of course, the computational complexity. So how many flops, how many operations you have to um, actually uh, compute for each layer without thinking about any parallelization. And in that case, you cannot say that self-attention will be always better than the RNNs or other models because usually uh, RNN or convolutional uh, neural networks, they actually re rely on um, the uh, dense matrix multiplication. That's why actually they have D square, right? Because uh, suppose that the, your, um, you say, remember that RNN definition was, um, the HT equal to sigma of, uh, you have, uh, for instance, you have XT, uh, and then you have some weight transformation, and plus you have HT minus one and the weight transformation, and then plus B, right? And then this is how much time it takes, it's TD squared, right? Because you're uh, multiplying each hidden state to some matrix. This is actually operation D squared operations. So this single, um, application of RNN will be over D2. And because you're actually doing this across the, uh, the entire text sequence, which has length of N, right? So that's why uh, it will be over N D squared. And it's quite similar for the, if you're using 1D convolution on the uh, text two. The only difference is that in fact, there, there is a, some uh, convolutional width and that's why the K is added. It's actually slower, right? But then self-attention is a uh, n squared d, and that's because the most operations happen when you are computing the attention itself. Which is, let's say that you know that um, when you're computing attention, it's uh, you basically have a QKT square root of d, and then you have softmax, and then you basically multiply V, right? This is how you compute attention. And this is, you are actually multiplying from, um, well, D by N, and then you have K transpose, which is uh, um, M by D. And then when you're computing the matrix multiplication between two matrices, the, um, the, the, the time complexity is always uh, D times N times N, whatever they share twice. So it's basically, actually my, my bad, uh, it's the other way, yeah. What I meant is that, yeah, they're N by D and then D by N, right? So always it's the, um, you, wh whatever they share is just counted only once and then if there is now sharing, it's actually counted separately. So n by d by d. So the time complexity of matrix multiplication is n square d, right? And what that means is then, of course, if n is bigger than d, then self attention will be slower. If d is bigger than n, then the recurrent neural net will be uh, slower. If you do everything sequentially, of course, not parallelization, but then. In most cases, D will be larger than N. So that means probably self-attention is usually at least um, as good as or better than recurrent neural networks. How about the sequential operations? Quite uh, apparent, right? Because self-attention can be computed just with uh, one matrix multiplication for the entire uh, time, time, uh, entire time. But then recurrent neural net, you have to apply this N times. So this cannot be parallelized. That's why it's O of N. And maximum path lengths here, it means that how many time, how many, uh, how many basically uh, times you have to hop to go from one token to another token within the text, same text. And attention has a connection for every 
token pair. So it's O1, but then RNN, um, in the worst case, you have to go from the uh, first token to last token with N operations. So that means you have, have path lines of O of N. And this, of course, is uh, the less, uh, the smaller, the better. The smaller, the better. Everything is actually smaller, the better here. So that's actually the good thing about self attention compared to recurrent neural networks. And also, uh, CNN also has a good parallelization, but it has also not as good um, path lines as the self attention because it's not fully connected. You actually have to apply a few layers to actually go from one token to the other. Okay. And let's talk about the accuracy of transformer. So I said that transformer is good, uh, but uh, I never said, uh, I never talked about how good this is, right? And uh, in fact, it's actually back, of course it has improved a lot since then. Um, they found more better ways to make this better, but then the transformer paper, the last version of transformer paper says that, for instance, first of all, um, the, the accuracy wise on blue score, it's actually always better than the non-transformer model, right? So it's like almost two points better on the English to German. Um, and then it's also quite similar to uh, the, the previous model on English to French. And usually English to German is considered harder than French because they're less similar. So it's very um, good, right? Still, they they have some difference too, and uh, it's also better than, for instance, uh, RNN-based models. Um, but what's more um, astonishing is actually the training cost. If you look at the convolution S to S ensemble, then you see that the, um, for instance, let's compare the French. It's uh, one point two times ten to 20, ten to the power of twenty one flops, but then. Now the transformer big model is able to reach a uh, very similar, actually even better performance with how many times uh, less flops? Well, it's like almost 50 times less flops. So you're now seeing very big, um, well, training cost advantage with even better blue score on English to French. And of course on in German, that's even actually, even, even it's much more because you look at this, um, I mean, in German, of course, your training cost actually is lower, but then still it has a better training cost, right? It's about only three times, but still three times is a lot. And now you're, uh, you have a 2%, two blue points better model with transformer. And um, last thing is actually relative pushing encoding. So I'm rushing a bit today, sorry. So we're not gonna have a, a break today. Um, so last thing is that up to now, we're talking about the absolute push encoding only, right? And that means that the each token has, a, each token position has a predefined embedding that's defined by the sinusoidal, sinusoidal function. But then what matters oftentimes is actually the relative position of a word with respect to the rest of the sentence instead of its absolute position, right? So in 2018, Shaw et al, after the transformer was proposed, some of the authors in transformer actually proposed relative pushing encoding, and uh, it's actually quite straightforward. So what they were interested in is, is that they didn't want to encode the position in the, on the input side, but then actually when they're performing attention, because when you're performing attention, you're talking about the relationship between tokens, and you want to actually encode uh, how far they are, what their distance is when you're performing attention to differentiate between uh, different tokens in different positions, right? So remember this original definition of a transformer, basically um, here, um, where is it? Remember that this is basically Q and this is K. So I'll use blue. You can think of this as a Q and this is K. Uh, they basically uh, describe Q with uh, um, X, X coming from the previous hidden states and uh, multiplying the, uh, the matrix to get the Q. And then now, in fact, looks like, uh, 
yeah, I don't remember why why they actually use different notations, but then they're the same thing here, basically. Or I mean, actually, EIJ is actually something. Okay, now I get it. Now I remember. So um, you can think of this as that AIJ is a softmax of EIJ. Okay. Of course, uh, on J side, um, J axis. Then this is a very, uh, very. I think this is very um, familiar to you. And what relative portion encoding does is that when they're performing the, first of all, uh, computing the attention logits, which is EIJ here, um, they actually add a vector or value that's, that's learnable parameter. And that depends on um, I and J, right? So that means that you will have a different value for different um, position pairs. And they do the same thing when you're computing the, um, the actually attended values on here, right? At here. So there are of course different parameters as indicated by either V or K. But then the point here is that, okay, that means that this value depends on the position I and J. And in fact, the way that they actually define uh, the AIJ is that uh, they just are interested in the difference between J, I and J. So how far they are. Is J be behind or after I? And if they are behind, then how, how far it is. If it's after, how far it is. So that's basically indicating this clip, I mean, this J minus I here, this one. But then of course, you, you cannot just define this for arbitrarily long, um, sequences so they actually clip it so if it's too far then they just um you know just uh consider that to be just k if it's bigger than k so if it's um j minus i is smaller than k then it's just j minus i but then if it's bigger than k then it's just k which is basically what this is uh, telling you right mean kx and then of course you want to do this on the negative side too so you actually max with the negative k Right. Very straightforward, right? So, in fact, the uh, relative portion encoding was also quite effective. Um, it was actually better than the original portion encoding in popular machine translation machine translation benchmarks. Not much, but non-trivially, and of course, this doesn't actually hurt because it's very easy to replace uh, sinusoidal encoding, and um, also we can. We can probably guess that this will avoid horrible fail, right? Very horrible fail on long sequences because of, uh, well, embeddings that are only, well, I would say, I mean, of course, will not probably, um, this will have probably happen, but then usually the relative encoding is probably um, more stable than the absolute embedding, absolute uh, encoding because you're only considering the relative positions. And that means then it's not sensitive to um, the different absolute positions. And that means, for instance, let's say you just add one more token to the front of some sequence, then the at least by um, the uh, absolute position encoding, this means that the everything has to change a lot because you are actually moving every word by one. But then um, if you're doing the uh, relative position encoding, you can guess that probably nothing much changes. So it's very, um, I would say, it has a lot of a good invariance. In fact, invariance is very important in deep learning. You are, there, uh, these are basically the, uh, you have to find invariance to make the model work well on different kinds of inputs. And you'll you see that it's giving some, some benefits, not much, like 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Uh, here, they're actually give, getting more increases like 1.3. That's actually considered a very significant 0.3 here. So, I mean, why not? I think that's the, uh, um, good thing, and there's nothing we lose by using relative encoding. So, in fact, uh, in modern language models, uh, a lot of language models use relative portion encoding. Okay, so um, it's good because I think I end, I, I'm, the, I'm ending the class a bit sooner than um, well, the one, uh, the nine, uh, uh, 10 15. But I think I, I covered everything. I wanted to today. So hopefully if you have missed something, then um, I'll, I'm gonna upload this on YouTube. So please watch that too. But by today, 
today we finished transformer. And next lecture, we'll be going into language model. And in the, le in the lecture 9, 10, 11, we're going to cover, um, and up to 12, we're going to cover, actually, uh, lecture 9 to 11 will be about pre-training and fine-tuning. We're going to actually cover BERT, T5, and GPT-2. Those are the, uh, I would say, core models that Number one, it's still used, and also number two, if they're they're not they're not too big that it's good for I think um, uh, introductory class. And in the last lecture, we'll be covering a few recent trends, including in context learning and also um, other ways of uh, other other things that's happening in the field. So thanks a lot. I'll see you um, on next Tuesday. Tuesday will be lab session, and we'll be as as I said for those of you who came late. Um, We'll have quiz on two, next Tuesday, and starting from next quiz, it'll uh, count towards your final grade. Not much, but uh, it will be basically one person per quiz. So please be prepared for the quiz. It will have five questions, mostly true or false, but sometimes numeric, numeric uh, questions. I'll give you ample time. Um, see you on Tuesday, and um, also we'll, I'm gonna release assignment three on next Tuesday as well. And your assignment one scores will be released next week too. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.